Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to the June 2025 CTSS quiz. I have 10 cases picked out just for you. And with that, let's get started. In this patient with suspected GI bleed, the most likely diagnosis is, well, you see, we're looking at something going on in the esophagus. The esophagus is markedly thickened all the way up, and then there's high density lower down. This is not simply a hiatal hernia. This is not just esophagitis. The wall is too thick. Cancer could be, but it's pretty smooth. But it's always a thought. With the sharp margins and the transition by the GE junction, this is more like achalasia. Markedly dilated esophagus, smooth borders, and the high density in the lumen is bleeding. This was a patient who bled, who had achalasia, a really nice example. The most likely diagnosis in this patient with a drop in hematocrit is, well, we see a mass near small bowel, way down in the lower abdomen. And when you look at the volume rendered views, you see that it's fed by branch vessels off the SMA, which are very vascular. Now, the mass is a budding bowel. It could be a carcinoid tumor. 70% of carcinoids do calcify, so that makes it a bit less likely a carcinoid. And I don't see desmoplastic reaction. Adenocarcinoma, it's just too vascular for an adenoCA. And I guess I can say the same thing about lymphoma. Lymphoma can give masses in the mesentery, but usually they're large and multiple, not a solitary two centimeter mass. A lesion like this adjacent to bowel, I've shown you other cases before, you gotta be thinking about a gist tumor. Gist tumors can have feeding vessels, they're vascular, they're smooth bordered. When they get large, they can ulcerate. Remember, stomach's the most common area for a gist tumor, but small bowel is the second most common area. And this was a gist tumor of the small bowel. In this patient with an acute abdomen and right lower quadrant pain, the best diagnosis is, well, what do I see? I see really thickened inflamed sigmoid colon. I could not, in theory, exclude cancer. But then you see what looks like probably an outpouching of the wall to the right with what looks like a mottled collection with air bubbles and fluid. This looks like a big abscess with perforation. In theory, it could be a colon cancer that perforated. I can't exclude that. It doesn't have the look of infiltration of Crohn's disease. Lymphoma can involve the large bowel, but usually it would be bulkier, and I don't see any other sites of disease like nodes. So the best answer, statistically, is going to be a perforation with abscess. There are some diverticuli in the patient's sigmoid colon, and the most common thing to perforate would be diverticulitis rather than cancer. And this was perforated sigmoid colon with diverticulitis and abscess. But I will admit it's hard to exclude a colon cancer or a colon cancer superimposed upon diverticulitis. The best diagnosis in this patient post-trauma is, when I look at the images, what do I see? Well, the patient's intubated. But I see the trachea, and there's no clear plane between the trachea and the esophagus. And air is trekking posteriorly, this thickening around the trachea and the esophagus. You can see that as well on the sagittal view. This is not the appearance of esophagitis, and obviously it's not the appearance of lung cancer. I don't see a foreign body, though we do know that with intubation, you could perforate the trachea. You could put it down the tube into the esophagus and potentially perforate that. But I don't see a lot of air in the neck, which is what you would see if that was the case. Rather, I see what appears to be communication of the trachea and esophagus, and this was secondary to trauma. It is, in this case, due to blunt trauma. I don't see a stab wound. You can see it from stab wounds, but you can see it also from blunt trauma. I don't see an associated um, aortic dissection either. The most likely diagnosis in this patient with hematuria is, 
what you can see is a large perirenal collection. Now, perirenal collections can be due to bleeding. It can be due to trauma, iatrogenic like a biopsy, or an MVA, or a stab wound, or a gunshot wound. Things in the perirenal space could be anything related to tumor like lymphoma, extramedullary hematopoiesis, and a number of other conditions can cause this as well. But in this patient, I don't see a mass, so a renal cell carcinoma, which can bleed, I don't see an RCC. I don't see an AML. The patient could have been an anticoagulant therapy, but then usually the bleed is a bit smaller and not so extensive in the perirenal space. The most likely diagnosis here would be trauma, and the patient had had a recent biopsy, and that's going to be the cause. Very nice example of perirenal hemorrhage in a patient post-biopsy. The most likely diagnosis in this patient, arterial and venous phase imaging. There's a very bright structure in the right kidney seen. It looks tubular. Yes, it would help me to have coronal views and 3D imaging, but I don't. But I'm showing you the venous phase, how everything washes out and is low density. It means that this is a vascular structure, not going to be a tumor to de-enhance so quickly. I don't see fat, so it's not a myelolipoma. It's not going to be an aneurysm. I see the tubular structures that are present. AV shunting, the fact is there is AV shunting. But the best diagnosis is going to be a renal AV malformation. AV malformations are very bright on arterial phase imaging and quickly wash out. They have mass effect and on venous or delayed phase imaging can easily be confused with a tumor. So a really nice example of a renal AVM. Again, on these quizzes, you have two images. I could have made your life easier by giving you some coronals or 3D maps. And that's what you should be using in practice to make the right diagnosis. In this patient with GI bleed and fever, the best diagnosis is, well, I see a mass in the liver with a calcification. This could be an abscess. And when you look at the possibilities I give you, um, abscess is right up there. It could also be a tumor, and it pushes on the gallbladder. But then when you look down to the right lower quadrant, there's a linear structure. Theoretically, it could be in bowel, but I think it's probably in the appendix. So what's the best diagnosis? Liver abscess is a possibility. I think it is an abscess. I don't see diverticulitis. Remember, you can get a liver abscess secondary to diverticulitis, secondary to appendicitis, or any perforation or inflammation of the small bowel. I don't think this is a liver tumor and bowel cancer. Rather, this is a liver abscess, and that linear calcification or high-density structure is actually a chicken bone. The patient had a perforation of bowel secondary to the chicken bone, and the patient then developed an abscess. A really nice example. you got to watch out for those chicken bones. The most likely diagnosis in this patient with an acute abdomen is, well, what do I see? I see mark thickening on the axial view of the descending colon, and it's pretty extensive from the level of splenic flexure down through descending colon, and we're probably not seeing the full extent of it. It does not have the irregularity of pseudomembranous colitis, which can be focal or diffuse. It doesn't look like Crohn's disease, and it doesn't look like a cancer. Rather, it looks like inflammation, inflammatory, ischemic, or otherwise. And this, when you look at the answers, the best answer that matches is ischemic colitis of the descending colon. We don't have all the vessels, there's plaque in the aorta, but I don't see occlusion of the IMA, the SMA, or celiac, but we don't have those images. So this was ischemic colitis. The most likely diagnosis for this incidental splenic lesion, the spleen is enlarged. There are multiple cystic lesions with rim-like calcifications. Hamartomas can be multiple, but usually they're solitary. And when they're multiple, they're large, and they tend to extend beyond the surface of the spleen. 
lymphoma is typically infiltrating. You do not have calcifications with lymphoma, but if it wasn't for the calcifications, anything with a big spleen could be lymphoma or myeloproliferative disease. Sarcoid can give you a big spleen with lesions, but the lesions don't calcify. And when you see splenic sarcoid, you usually see disease also in the liver. The liver looks good here. Splenic hemangiomas, the spleens can be large, multiple calcifications, some calcified, some not calcified are the typical appearance. Clippel trinani weber disease gives you the largest spleen with multiple hemangiomas and calcifications present. The most likely diagnosis in this case, when you look carefully at the axial views, there's a large fatty tumor by the renal or adrenal bed. On the coronal views, you see it's pushing on the kidney. It's in the adrenal bed. I don't think it's a liposarcoma because it really looks like it's coming shape-wise and position-wise from the adrenal gland. It's not a renal mass pushing up like a myelolipoma. ACCs, primary adrenal cortical carcinomas, can theoretically have fat, but it's a minimal amount of fat, and usually it's an aggressive tumor with invasion of the fat. This lesion has some soft tissue density, but 90 plus percent of it is fat, and this is going to be an adrenal myelolipoma. With myelolipomas, there's no risk of malignancy, but there's risk of bleeding. Once a lesion gets above 5 centimeters in most series, the lesion should be resected. Well, those were 10 cases. I hope you enjoyed them, and I hope to see you back here next month. Have a great day, everybody. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.